Fritzing parts fast, drawing for breadboard view. Things covered in part one will be abbreviated here, so watch part one first for the full details. The first thing we do is ungroup the major breadboard group that we just created in the last video, so they don't influence any of our objects. So it's object, ungroup, now we just have our bare objects. This makes it easy to put objects in order later. Back to our part, we now have to add components to make it look good. This is explained in part one in detail, but to get a component drawing, we need to find a part with that component drawing on it. Then it's the usual right click, edit part, go to the view with the drawing you want, then it's just file, show in folder, then make a copy of the SVG so we can work on it. Other methods to get the SVGs is in part one. Then open the SVG in Inkscape. Inkscape setup and usage is in part one. To get a part fast, click on node select button, then click on an object in the part. Then go to the highlighted object in XML editor and see if it's in a group. And now that the group is selected, just copy and paste. If the component is not in a group, but separate objects, like this LED, you have to ungroup down to its level. So you take the arrow select, you can't click on it, but it selects the whole board. So you go object, ungroup, click in an open space, you click on it again, you still get the whole board, so it's object, ungroup, click, click on it again, and you get this square. So it's object, ungroup, our part is now separate objects, so just box select it, then object group. And now you can move it where you want. Give the group a specific name so it's easy to find. You've brought in your parts, but you don't like the look of some of them. Like this USB is showing 7 by 8.5 mil when the actual part is 9 by 10 millimeters, so just punch those numbers in. Down here we have two buttons that need their colors reversed, so you can node select, click on it, and select a color. Another way to do it is arrow select, click on the group, go to transform, go to rotate, punch in 180, and then apply. These parts are top view down but these are kind of isometric, showing front and top, and to make a top view only, click on it, open the group, and start deleting nodes, so that only the top view is left. Next we have to position parts. These are non-working parts, so the position isn't super critical. You can roughly measure the distance to components on your module, click on the part, and just use rough coordinates. Or you could turn the snap off, grab the part, and just position it by eye. Next we're going to do some simplified part drawings, and we'll start with the ICs. Start with Rectangle Select. With Grid Snap on, click on an intersection and drag it to another intersection. Select the colour for the fill. Go to Fill and Stroke and Stroke Paint and turn off the stroke. Switch back to Arrow Select. My IC is 15 by 15 millimeters and this shows the selected part is 10 by 10 millimeters. So we lock height and width together with the padlock. Change one dimension to 15 millimeters and that changes the other as well. Then it's Edit Duplicate. Then change the dimension to your second IC. Then just position them. Next we'll make a crystal out of our IC. Just click on it, unlock it, and it's 10mm by 3mm. We go back to rectangular select, and with these boxes we can change the corner radius. Punch in half your 3mm height, which is 1.5mm in each box, and that will round the ends. Then just change the fill colour. You can do the same thing with a straight line, that is just a stroke. Just go to stroke style and make it 3mm and select round ends. Then hold the shift key down and select the stroke color. If you want to do a circle, select the circle button. Click on an intersection, hold the control and alt key down and drag to another intersection. Back to arrow, then lock the height and width together and resize. Select the fill color, then move it where you want. You could add tantalums, which are a yellow rectangle with a red rectangle on the end. Capacitors are beige rectangles. Basically add as many components as you want. For logos, look for a picture. Try for the scalable vector graphics versions, because they scale without loss. Basically, they can't pixelate. If you can only find a raster version, in Inkscape it's file. Then import. Select file. I use defaults. You can see the picture is not as good as a vector drawing. Then it's object. Trace bitmap. Press update to see the output of the current settings. Then just try different settings until you see something you like. For me, it was auto trace with two colors. Then when you're happy, just hit OK. Then in XML Editor, you have your new SVG path and your old raster drawing, and you must delete the raster. Then just copy and paste it in, then resize it and change the color if needed. Next is text, and it's a bit tricky because there's two ways Fritzing will accept text. The official way, where you can re-edit the text, 
and the unofficial way where you can't re-edit the text but is less hassle. Officially, Fritzing can only display two fonts, Droid Sans and OCRA, and the way to get them is to download the fonts and templates folder from this download zip link. Unzip, then double click on each of the five fonts and then press install. Then restart Inkscape so the fonts load. The truth is, Fritzing has a problem with any font coming from Inkscape, even the official ones. And the workaround is to ignore the warning and let Fritzing swap out its own Droid Sans when you load this SVG into the part editor. First we'll do the pin labels and it's recommended to use method 1. Even though it doesn't matter what font you use, because Fritzing will correct it to one of its two, you could even use one of the others, like Arial. Still use one of the official ones so you'll know what it looks like in the drawing stages. The first thing we do is open our text and font dialog box and that's with the T button here or text and text and font. Next we select our font, scroll down to what we want. I'll use Droid Sans because it looks the closest. I'll try regular. Pick an arbitrary size and I'll go for 12 pixels. Then we set that as default. Next we click on the font button and up here should be what you selected. If it's not what you selected, click on the page and make sure it changes to what you selected. Then type in your word. The first thing you'll see is lines in the letters, and that's because we have to set our fill and stroke. So we go fill and stroke, we want fill, but we don't want stroke. Now we have to set this as default, and you do that by double clicking on the font button. In text, just press take from selection. You can see stroke none and fill black. The other place to find this is in edit, preferences. You should change text stroke color before you set it as default. But if I change it to white now, you wouldn't see it on this white background. Let's now test if it's going to fit. So we arrow select, transform, rotate, 90 degrees, apply, grab it, and see how it fits. And it's a bit big. So back to font, click and drag select, then change to a smaller font with the top toolbar. The top toolbar is for editing made text where the text and font dialog box is for presetting text and setting it as a default. Other ways to select a text is hit the arrow button and just click on the text object. Or box select. This only works if the drawing is not grouped. Or just hitting it in the XML editor. Then switch back to font, change it to what you like, I'm going for bold. Then lastly to change colour, go back to arrow select, it's selected and just hit the colour. Now we have our font the way we like it and in the position we want it. Next we can select the text in the XML editor or with the arrow select just plain click on it. Hit the duplicate button and because our pins are 100 thou apart we have to move our duplicate text 100 thou. So we change our arrow button units to an inch. So while the duplicate is still selected we'll subtract 0.1 of an inch off the X coordinates. Another method is to box select so long as the drawing is not in a group. Then it's edit and duplicate. And now that there's two text objects, you subtract 0.2 of an inch off the X coordinates. Another way is to box select and use the Ctrl D shortcut to duplicate. Four text objects, so subtract 0.4 off the X coordinates. Repeat till you've done them all, then box select, then its object and group. There's two ways to change the writing in text. One is to click the font button, click inside the text and type what you want. But with the second method, we select the text in the XML editor, open up till you get the actual word, Select it and then just type in the new letters. Do not hit the enter key at the end, just go to the next text and change its letters. All our text is finished, so we select the group, then we duplicate that. And we notice the height of this group is 3.633 millimeters. Now we watch these X, Y coordinates for the cursor and put our cursor where we want the edge to be, which is 55.75. So we subtract those and we get 52.117. Then after you've finished all of those, the usual select group, duplicate, and with the arrow button selected, we switch it to inch. Then we subtract the two inches from the Y coordinate that we measured in part one. Then it's the same with the first text, duplicate, two inches, then edit the new labels. To finish text method one, there's one more step, to remove the PX in the code. But I'm going to tell you last, because it's the last thing you should be doing. Text method two. In method 1, we can hit the font button, click in our text and add what we like. But in method 2, we arrow select the text, path, and select object to path. And now if we go to font, we can't do anything inside it. And if we look in the XML editor, our text now becomes paths. So to Fritzing, it's now just a graphic, like a logo. And that means you can use any font, style or size, because Fritzing won't care about it anymore. If you select the group and arrow select, you can treat it like any other object. 
you would use this for general text that you're not going to edit again. We've finished our drawing. Now we get to our pin group. Move it to the bottom. Technically, we don't have to do this because we've assigned our pins in Inkscape. Then it's Edit, Select All, Object, Group. And then we rename that group Breadboard. Breadboard is a fritzing identifier. While everything is all selected, we resize the page to drawing. Basically, fritzing will cut off anything bigger than the page size. And since in part one we made the board the same size as the page size, it's going to cut off all these objects hanging over the page. So it's Edit, Resize Page to Selection. And our border is now out here. Now is when we fix the code for our method 1 text. Warning, do not do any text code correction until everything else is done. If you correct the text code and you move the text object, the text code will revert back to what it was and you'll have to do it all again. So make your text and fix it up how you want it and then just before you save this drawing, go and correct the code. It's actually advisable to load your SVG drawing into a dummy fritzing part before you fix the code, like we did in part 1. That way you can correct any mistakes in the drawing before doing the critical method 1 text code correction. The crux of the problem is Inkscape adds the PX units to the font size and instead of the text being the normal size, fritzing takes it literally and makes it tiny. To fix it we select our text and click on the style code and remove the first instance of PX in the code. You could also remove the quotes around destroyed sands so to avoid the fritzing error message but that's more work with no gain because fritzing will swap out its own droid sands in the edit. If you look at OCRA and its code, it only has the PX problem. There's no quotes on the first font name. We now have to save it, so we go File, Save As, but pick Plain SVG, and save that. Back in Fitzing, we right click and edit our 100 pin part. While you're in Breadboard View, it's File, and then Load Image for View. Select our drawing and open. Ignore the font warning. Our drawing looks OK, but we'll check our connectors and they all have ticks and we see crosshairs on our pins here and here but if we look here our crosshairs look funny and if we zoom in six of the pins don't have full crosshairs these pins probably will still anchor a wire because they have a semblance of a crosshair but to fix it just click on the pin name until it's highlighted then hit center for the wire anchor point if your part has long narrow pins like this one you have to set your wire anchor point to the end of the tip using these compass points and in this case it'll be the east end of the pin if the pin has no crosshair at all, you can try to manually assign it in fritzing if you can. The first thing you do is see if you can select the connector box. And the first thing you'll notice when you try to come in is different groups sliding up. Then when you get closer, even more objects highlight. And even closer, the facets of the top of the pin get in the way. But if you're lucky and can get the connector box to highlight, you select the pin name in the table that you want, click on select graphic, and then try to hit that box and click on it. This is why you put your connector pin rectangle at the highest level in Inkscape because it would be impossible to assign in Fritzing Edit if it was under another object. In Inkscape, if you don't want to rename all your connector pin ID names to the Fritzing Auto Assign name, you can leave the plain rectangles the way they are and manually assign them inside Fritzing Edit. Just remember, if you change something on this drawing and bring it back into your Fritzing part, you'll have to reassign these all over again. That's why the Fritzing Auto Assign name is better for large pin count parts because you won't have to manually reassign the pins in fritzing again if you do an update. On a side note, if you can't find a fritzing IC with enough pins to make a part from, just go to connectors and just punch in the number of pins you want. If you have a big part like this with common connector names, you can set internal connections. Then just join the common connector name pins with an internal wire. You can click on a pin and use the yellow highlights to see what is connected. Next we go to icon view and file, reuse breadboard image and break the breadboard. As a final check we can click on our pin and just arrow down and see that they all light up. And when you're happy just go file, save as new part, give it a name, save it. If you close it now you'll get an error that the other views don't have pins assigned but just ignore it because we haven't done our other drawings yet. It's best now to save the bin in case of a crash and you lose your part. You can do a quick test of the part, just grab it Pins on the bedboard go green, wires connect, looks fine. In the next part we'll be looking at the schematic drawing.